and it's only on my show, Monster Vision, that we take forgotten and neglected classics like this one. We restore them in our secret film restoration labs at 1010 Techwood Drive in Atlanta, Georgia. We try to get the most perfect print we can find. And then our crack TNT lab technicians run it over and over again. They freeze it on every frame. They're searching for that one frame where you can see Bo Derek's breasts. And then they look at that one a long time. But do they go to that trouble at any other network? I think not. I'm Joe Bob Briggs, and I represent Monster Vision, where films are revered and breasts are revealed occasionally. Next on TNT. Next, Joe Bob on TNT. You know how Oprah does that? Rednecks in leper colonies. Next, Oprah. You know how she does that? Whales with bipolar personality disorder. Next, Joe Bob. See Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs next on TNT. Anytime you meet a new gal who might be willing to have sex with you, every other woman you know can smell that she's in town. You know, they don't even know her name. They don't know where she came from. They just suddenly know that there's some possibility you could be aardvarking on the beach somewhere, and they make it their goal in life to snuff out any happiness you might be about to have. Do you sense that I'm preoccupied this evening? Well, don't worry. We got Orca the Killer Whale coming up. Richard Harris versus Shamu in the movie that tried to be Jaws, but should have been called Molars. <laughs> I'm Joe Bob Briggs. See, I'm, I'm talking about this woman named Estelle La Vega that I met two weeks ago, and she's the finest dolphin trainer in the greater Alpine, Texas metropolitan area. But as soon as she checked into the Grapevine Motel 6, I had Wanda Bodine, Vita Stegall, and Cherry Dilday all calling me up at the same moment. I had so much call waiting going on, the only thing I ever said in the conversation was, can you hold on, baby doll? <laughs> even though in the case of Wanda, I hadn't even touched the hair on her elbow in three years. And with Vita Stegall, the last time I saw her, she said I had the morals of a weasel. What does that mean, the morals of a weasel? Anyhow, my only point is, what kind of psychic friends network is this that radars out to every woman you've ever made the sign of the triple humped paddywhack with and says, make Joe Bob miserable. A woman is interested in him and she is not completely ugly. I mean, even the ex-wives get into it. What is that about? Isn't that the point of being an ex-wife, the ex part in there? I mean, doesn't that mean that they don't ever want to touch anything on your body unless it involves folding leather and plastic picture holders? You know? My second ex-wife, also known as the anti-wife, had an APB out on Estelle. She had every Birkenstock-wearing, lard-bottomed bridge club member in Grapevine, Texas, ready to plant grenades in that woman's bra. <laughs> I see you found you a little chicky, were her exact words. I said, she's not a chicky. She's a woman in the full bloom of her sexuality who sits in the same room with a cigar and says, I love how you smell when you smoke. I think we're talking about a different species here than any woman I have ever known. And the anti-wife says, she's just doing that until you marry her. And then she went into this secret agent theory of how women lie and wait for men by pretending to like everything they do until they get that ring on their finger and then they nuke them. Of course, the anti-wife was describing herself, but this irony was lost on her. You know what started this whole thing? First Wives Club. Even the second wives started watching that movie. What was the whole point of feminism? No fault divorce laws, right? That's why we love feminism. That's okay though, I'm gonna be all right because I'm getting a cabin up at Lake Texoma. They won't be able to find us without renting a bass boat. And that's all I'm gonna say about it. But speaking of nasty relationships, this week's flick is the sensitive story of a careless man who kills a killer whale's wife. You know what this movie is? Uh, Death Wish. Yeah. Same exact plot, only instead of Charles Bronson, you've got Orca the Whale. Yeah. And if you hadn't seen this movie, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for you, though. I have lots of info on it since you're going to be sitting there saying, what were they thinking? But we'll do the drive-in totals in a minute. But watch this. Two stars. Check it out. We'll be here. 
A killer whale is a lot like a woman. Pay attention to them, and they'll go to SeaWorld and make a bundle. Ignore them, they'll eat your legs off. That's kind of the message of this whole movie. I'm oversimplifying, of course. Hey, Joe Bob Briggs here, and look at all these emails that just poured in today. Let's just read one. Hey, cowboy, did your mother smoke crack when she was pregnant with you? Well, we just love to hear from all our wonderful Monster Vision fans, and there are two ways you can do that. You can write to me in care of Monster Vision at 1010 Techwood Drive, Atlanta, Georgia, 30318, or you can email me at monstervision at turner.com. And you can also visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com slash monstervision and make my life a living hell directly from there. <laughs> Try another one. Dear Joe Bob, you su hey. A lot of mail came in today. <laughs> Catch Monster Vision with Joe Bob Briggs and Reno the Mail Girl every Saturday night on TNT. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. Let me see if I can recap our story thus far. Richard Harris is a mean old man who's out hunting great white sharks, minding his own business, when suddenly a killer whale attacks a great white and chomps it into a bloody pulp in order to save the life of clumsy diver Robert Carradine, later to become famous as the head nerd in Revenge of the Nerds. But here working for beautiful marine biologist Charlotte Rampling, who lectures on orcas at a school that seems to be located way out in the middle of nowhere and provides all the exposition for the rest of the movie by presenting a slideshow in which she states how killer whales are bringers of death who have a profound instinct for vengeance. Meanwhile, crusty old sea captain Richard Harris decides he can make more money if he catches a killer whale and sells it to an aquarium, and so he starts rigging his ship, but Charlotte Rampling happens to wander up to where he's snarling and ask him to quit, especially when his own assistant, the lovely and lissom Bo Derek, not yet famous in tin, points out that whales are monogamous, and it bothers her that they might be busting up a happy family, even though at that moment Bo Derek was, in fact, busting up the marriage of John Derek and Linda Evans. Richard Harris then gets out his heart harpoon gun, misfires, wounds the female killer whale instead of the male, hauls it up on the ship, witnesses a whale miscarriage, then washes the dead fetus overboard like a heartless abortionist, causing mommy and daddy orca to both roar like wounded jaguars. <laughs> daddy orca is so mad that he jumps up and eats Keenan Wynn, then gives Richard Harris the big killer whale evil eye before he swims away, signaling, I'll be back with his bloody wounded fin. Does that about sum it up? Yeah. Wouldn't want to exaggerate or anything. Okay, back to the 1977 classic, Orca. Sometimes the facts kind of speak for themselves, you know. You know, we have hardcore depraved cyber geeks who never miss a single week in the Monster Vision chat room. Some of them hadn't changed clothes or showered in three, four days, and they get in this kind of computer keyboard psycho freakazoid zone, and they want to discuss Antonioni with me. <laughs> Check this out at tnt.turner.com slash monstervision. But whatever you do, don't mention the early work of Francois Truffaut when he was a critic for Cahiers de Cinema. That drives them crazy. <laughs> Come meet all the Monster Vision fans in our chat room at tnt.turner.com forward slash monstervision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. That's Will Sampson as the wise old Indian. Will Sampson had a whole career of playing wise old Indians. Yeah. He was best known as the Indian in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but he was also in the Outlaw Josie Wales and Alcatraz, which we had on Monster Vision in April. He died suddenly right after completing Poltergeist 2. Anyway, when you've got Italian screenwriters doing dialogue for the Indian, <laughs> you end up with stuff like, she speak you the truth. <laughs> and orcas always remember the human being who tried to harm them. In other words, this whale wants Richard Harris. It's almost like they read Moby Dick, and they said, you know what would be an interesting twist? Instead of having the whale chew off Captain Ahab's arm and so... Captain Ahab becomes bitter and vengeful his whole life. We'll have Captain Ahab do something to the whale. Yeah. And then the whale will become bitter and vengeful his whole life. Yeah. 
And maybe somebody at the meeting said, but uh, it's a whale. Yeah. And they said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll have Charlotte Rampling explain how smart the whale is. And then we'll have a wise old Indian talk about how psycho a whale can be. And maybe at the meeting they said, but it looks like, you know, the whale looks like uh, Shamu. <laughs> it really doesn't look that fierce. And they said, yeah, but we'll give it a bloody cut fin. Ooh. They say, ooh, well, in that case, let's spend several million dollars on it. So let's see just how far whale vengeance can go as Orca continues. And I promised those drive-in totals, so I need to give those to you. We have six dead bodies, two dead whales, one dead shark, one whale miscarriage, whale mating sounds, suicidal whale, ship ramming, four shipwrecks, one car crash, one exploding building, one exploding oil refinery, multiple whale attacks against a fishing village, multiple character actor chomping, one avalanche, gratuitous frolicking killer whale footage, gratuitous Bo Derek, dynamite foo, harpoon foo, iceberg foo, two stars. I love the part where the school of whales were in mourning. They made those eerie, sad whale sounds. I guess... Now that's the same sound you made for Godzilla. That can't be the whale sound. It was kind of a whale wailing sound. You know, whales wailing about the whalers. Let's try it again. It's pitiful. Hi, I'm Reno, the Monster Vision mail girl. And in case you don't know, Monster Vision is also on the internet. And it's updated every week. To find us, go to tnt.turner.com slash monstervision. And you'll see our horrible lead stories of the week. In fact, you might even find out something about me. Pleasant dreams. See Reno deliver the Monster Vision fan mail to Joe Bob Briggs every Saturday night on TNT. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. Let me get this straight. The whale destroyed everybody's boat except Richard Harris's boat because he wants Richard Harris to come out into the open sea and face him like a mammal. It's kind of a western. Meet me in the Atlantic and bring your harpoon. But then Richard Harris gets the idea that he'll just apologize to the whale. <laughs> because he understands the pain of the whale. He lost his wife, too, to a drunk driver. But, of course, now it's too late. The whale is so out of control, he's causing car crashes. I didn't imagine that part, did I? He, he caused a car crash, right? He's attacking the wharf. He's setting buildings on fire. Boats are exploding and burning up because of this whale. And then the whale burns up the oil refinery. <laughs> You know, it's one thing to chew up a few cast members, but this whale is committing industrial espionage. He's become Psycho Whale. You've heard of Son of Sam? Son of Shamu. <laughs> Roll it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when Charlotte Rampling wakes up in the morning, does she have full face makeup and every hair in place like she sleeps with Vidal Sassoon or something? And is she in love with Richard Harris? They wouldn't get that gross, would they? No. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. All right, Orca has gone too far now. He bites off Bo Derek's leg. Yeah. And then he knocks Richard Harris's house in the water. And then he leaps for joy. He's out there celebrating. Where did that house come from, anyway? Richard Harris doesn't live in the village, right? If he's being tormented by a killer whale, why would he choose the only house that's built on stilts and standing in the water? And why is the only solution to sail out into the ocean and fight the whale? <laughs> The wise old Indian seems to be saying, well, you must go to him because he will not rest. He will find you. He wants you. Not in Kansas, he won't find you. Why don't they uh, just go to North Dakota? You know, the whale is not going to be destroying any houses in Bismarck. Anyway, the voice of that whale, those are not real whale voices. Big surprise, right? <laughs> you mean it's not totally authentic? No. 
Those whale vocalizations were done by the great Percy Edwards, who was the, mo who was the most famous animal vocalist in England. He could do over 600 different bird calls and a number of other animals. He did the reindeer sounds in Santa Claus the movie. Mm -hmm. He did the animals in the plague dogs. And he was the voice of the alien in the original Alien. He was so popular in Britain that he was decorated by the Queen, and he died two years ago at the age of 88. Wow. Okay, let's see what that wacky Richard Harris does next in Orca. Richard Harris. Remember that song, MacArthur Park? You remember that big number one hit? That was Richard Harris singing that song. That was like the only record Richard Harris ever made. And then evidently he left his cake out in the rain or something because yeah. here he is showing up in Orca, you know. MacArthur Park, always the closing number in Wayne Newton's act. You know the part in Wayne's act where it actually rains on the stage? That's great. I don't think he has an actually, actual cake because that would be gross to put a cake and let rain on it on the stage. But MacArthur Park is the big closer. Wayne Newton. Or is it Patriotic Medley? Might be Patriotic Medley, the one where he plays all the instruments. Yep. I love Wayne, hardest working man in show business. Hey, Joe Bob Briggs here, and look at all these emails that just poured in today. Let's just read one. Hey, cowboy, did your mother smoke crack when she was pregnant with you? Well, we just love to hear from all our wonderful Monster Vision fans, and there are two ways you can do that. You can write to me in care of Monster Vision at 1010 Techwood Drive, Atlanta, Georgia, 30318, or you can email me at monstervision at turner.com, and you can also visit the Monster Vision website at tnt.turner.com slash monstervision and make my life a living hell directly from there. <laughs> Try another one. Dear Joe Bob, you said... Hey. A lot of mail came in today. Catch Monster Vision with Joe Bob Briggs and Reno the Mail Girl every Saturday night on TNT. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. Is Charlotte Rampling wearing an evening gown on the boat? Did I just see that? Right after the whale ate Ken? <laughs> You know, of all the low points in Richard Harris's career, this might be, th no, there was a worse one. The next time he teamed up with Bo Derek, it was Tarzan the Ape Man in 1981, the worst Tarzan movie ever made, the one, that, the one that was directed by Bo's husband, John Derek, and Tarzan wasn't allowed to speak in the movie because they were afraid he would upstage Bo as Jane. My buddy Miles O'Keefe played Tarzan. Miles can talk. They just wouldn't let him talk. Anyway, Richard Harris was nominated for an Oscar for the movie This Sporting Life in 1963, and then he never really followed through on that. He was good friends with Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole, but he only got the jobs that they didn't get. He was uh, King Arthur in Camelot. Everybody remembers that. And he starred in A Man Called Horse. Yeah. Everybody remembers him going through that Indian initiation ceremony where they string him up by his pierced breasts. Long before piercing was trendy, Richard, <laughs> Richard was puncturing those nipples. And, of course, here at TNT, we remember him for starring in Abraham, one of our Bible movies at yep. TNT. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> We're filming the entire Bible at Turner. I can't wait, you know, till we do Deuteronomy. Oh. I'm waiting for that one. Anyway, Richard Harris had a drinking problem for years. He's Irish, you know. You can kind of see the liquor there on his face. And he didn't sober up until 1981. And then he had kind of a personal triumph in 1990 when he got his second Oscar nomination for The Field. And I believe that's enough Richard Harris trivia. And somebody told me he's in Lost in Space. But I saw it, and I didn't notice him. But we would much rather dwell on one of the most humiliating roles of his career <laughs> as the confused and cranky Captain Nolan in Orca. You know the most amazing thing about Orca? It made money. People went to it, you know? That summer of 1977, every critic in America told them just how awful it was, and they said, we don't care. We want to go watch a killer whale eat people. It was a turkey, but it was a money-making turkey, like that movie Indecent Proposal. You know, how was it? Terrible. Really? I think I'll go see it tomorrow. 
You know, we have hardcore, depraved cyber geeks who never miss a single week in the Monster Vision chat room. God. Some of them hadn't changed clothes or showered in three, four days, and they get in this kind of computer keyboard psycho freakazoid zone, and they want to discuss Antonioni with me. <laughs> Check this out at tnt.turner.com slash monstervision. But whatever you do, don't mention the early work of Francois Truffaut when he was a critic for Cahiers de Cinema. That drives them crazy. <laughs> Come meet all the Monster Vision fans in our chat room at tnt.turner.com forward slash Monster Vision. Back to Monster Vision host Joe Bob Briggs and Orca on TNT. Come, I'll warm you. The most famous line in the movie, the one that caused audiences to erupt in uncontrolled laughter <laughs> when Orca first came out. Dare we interrupt this tense narrative as the killer whale leads these idiots inexorably toward the ice flows. Remember, ice cuts both ways. Another great line. I think we can pause just a moment, though, for Joe Bob's advice to the hopeless. And to help us out with that is the beautiful TNT oh, yeah. male girl, Rusty. And Rusty, I can't yeah. believe you finally did what I asked you to do. You yeah. finally wore a bikini. Yes. Well, it's in keeping of the theme of tonight's movie, or not. Well, you fill it out very nicely. Better than Bo Derek, I think. Please, I can't stand Bo Derek. You can't stand Bo? Did you see her in uh, Ghost Can't Do It? Where she's still in love with Anthony Quinn, even though he's dead, and so he comes back in the body of a young hunk on the beach in Sri Lanka, and they aardvark around in the surf? I missed that. <laughs> what have you got against Bo? No woman with half a brain cares about Bo Derek. She's the only Mrs. John Derrick who could hold him. She's the youngest one. <laughs> yeah, but look what he gave up. Ursula Andress and Linda Evans. Who look and act exactly like Bo Derrick. <laughs> so? So their combined IQ is like 30. <laughs> 30, like 10, 10, and... Well, Linda Evans, is, <laughs> Linda Evans is more than 10 IQ. She lived with Yanni. Oh. Right. Okay. Let's talk about something more interesting. Tonight's letter is from Eric L. Whitworth of San Francisco. Okay. From the internet. Joe Bob, you lame jack <laughs> <laughs> Back to the future? Yes, it's true. He saw the schedule. We're showing Back to the Future next week. You're now another perfect example of a corporate takeover. You're probably playing golf with Ted on Saturdays, sipping some sizzy, sissy, fuzzy drinks, and listening to how ratings will increase if you change your format to a more family-oriented venue. Hi, this is Joe Bob Briggs, and next week we'll be presenting our feature film, A Very Brady Christmas, five and a half stars. Joe Bob says, check it out. Get your into a trailer with a case of Lone Star and think about the damage that you have caused to those who no longer have access to drive-ins or monster vision. Where is our America going? Eric L. Whitworth. Eric, <laughs> a tough letter, you know. I'm not thrilled to be playing Back to the Future. I hate it when we have those Spielberg nights, but what can I do? You know, go to a leather bar, ask to be flogged. You know, I'm, in, I'm enthralled to these high sheriffs who sometimes just don't get it. I also want to mention, I got a letter. I'm thinking about it. Do you like my bolo? Love it. It's Coco Pelli, you know, the, the oh, yeah. uh, symbol of the Anasazi Indians. This was sent to me by Ed Biggs, a silver worker in Elgin, Texas, and I just wanted to give Ed All some right, credit yeah. for giving me a free bolo. As to golf, though, I don't know how to play golf. You don't know how to play golf? You like golf? Yes, I play at least three times a week. I could learn golf. Maybe you need somebody to drive the cart or something. You would do that for me? Yeah, uh, it'd be a sacrifice, but uh, uh. yeah, I would drive the cart. Okay. Okay, what? You can drive the cart. And maybe I'll learn to play. Nah, but... that would take too much time. But you could drive the cart for me and my boyfriend. <laughs> oh. You, you, you can drive the cart. Thanks. Back to Orca. <laughs> but that's what you said. You could drive the cart. You wanted to drive the cart. Yes, that's what I said.
back to Joe Bob's Last Call and Philadelphia Experiment 2 on TNT. Oh, that song. I'm Joe Bob Briggs, still here. I'm surprised I am because of that credit song. Please. It's called We Are One. Sounds like an off-key French art song or something. Written by the great Ennio Morricone, the composer who did all the spaghetti westerns. Oh, anyway, Orca flips Richard Harris like a flapjack, buries the wise old Indian under an avalanche of paper mache ice, winks at Charlotte Rampling, and swims off into the sunset. And they wonder why people laughed. Next week, Fourth of July weekend, is a very special week on Monster Vision because it's the beginning of the TNT summer session, what we call Joe Bob's Summer School. And if you watch all ten weeks of Monster Vision from Fourth of July to Labor Day, you can actually get high school credit because the Jefferson Davis Votec High School in Bogalusa, Louisiana is offering credit for extremely slow learners, which, let's face it, that's our whole audience here on Monster Vision. So if you pass the final exam of 42 questions, and you won't be able to pass it unless you watch all the shows, then you will get a diploma signed by yours truly. And next week is Physics and Trigonometry Night with two time travel classics, Back to the Future and time after time. In just a minute here, I'm going to give you a little preview of that when I explain the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, it'll give you a flavor of what's in store this summer. Three weeks from tonight, by the way, we'll have a visiting professor on the show. Wes Craven will be here. Wes started out as a professor of philosophy long before he was a film director. And then uh, help, help, he'll be here to help me host a Wes Craven double feature. And four weeks from tonight, We'll have uh, Ice T we'll, for Black Studies Night. Black Scholar Ice T for Black Studies Night. But right now, let's get started on Philadelphia Experiment 2. And it's one of those time travel flicks where Brad Johnson has to travel back to 1943, which is where he started out in the first movie, where the airplane disappeared and he ended up in 1984. And now he's lived nine years in the present time, so it's 1993, and he thinks that maybe when he came through the time and space vortex the first time, he accidentally let the Nazis grab a stealth bomber. So now maybe in 1943, they're going to use the stealth bomber to annihilate Washington, D.C., which they might have already done, because it's 1993. And if they did that, then America, as we know it, doesn't really exist. Only if that's true, then how is it possible for Brad Johnson to be living in this little suburban California community where his son plays Little League, and then these evil military types start playing around with time travel and zapping Brad's DNA so he has these bad headaches. Anyway, before you know it, he ends up in a different 1993, the one that happened after Washington was bombed, but we didn't know that Washington was bombed. You see why I can't stand talking about these movies? They just give you a headache. The movie itself gives you a headache. Anyhow, Starts off kind of slow, but it builds up to some great scenes at the end. Let's look at those drive-in totals. 24 dead bodies. Three raging gun battles. One exploding house with fireball. One exploding military aircraft with fireball. Two bullets to the forehead. Throat slitting. And I'm going to give it two and a half stars. Check it out. And we'll be back with some jailbreak and some other cool stuff. And... Uh, I, I know I just kind of gave up on that one, didn't I? Yeah. I started to explain it, and, and you know why? It's because I get all these letters. Joe Bob, why did you tell us what was going to happen? We don't like that. You told us the whole movie. I don't ever tell you what's going to happen. Do I do that? Do I tell what's going to happen? No. I give you the drive-in totals, a general idea, a general idea, so you can decide whether to stay here with us or surf on over to the Food Network, you know?